coaching a fight here talking about the third temple yep today is June the 6th 2020 and as always I'm praying and asking the father for what kind of class he wants me to do I have my own methods of getting um, answers from the father some of you guys may be aware of it some of you guys most of you guys probably aren't aware of it and it's called drawing lots um, I have a way of drawing lots um, to to get answers so when you when you hear me say you know the Lord told me to do this or the Lord told me to do that it's usually because I drew lots on it and the lots turned out to, to point in that direction and what the lots came out today to talk about is the third temple and <clears throat> not necessarily the timing of the third temple but more of a description of what the third temple is and so what I decided to do is to go into Google and simply put in third temple in the Bible and then we're gonna go down and we're gonna pick one of these websites and that's talking about the third temple um, and we're gonna just see what they say make some comments on what they say compare uh, their understanding of the third temple compared to what we understand about the third temple so this should be a pretty fun class um, I do want to try to answer some of the questions that I have been getting here recently in this class. I want to thank Dr. All, Barry All, for mentioning our humble channel in one of his videos. We really appreciate that. On yesterday, we had over 500 subscribers. We normally would have done a 2,000 subscriber celebration kind of video, but we blew 2,000 subscribers wide open. And so I guess we'll wait to 3,000 subscribers to do something related to that. But, but again, I want to thank um, Dr. All for mentioning us in his uh, video. I want to welcome all of those guys who have come over to check out our channel. You'll find out that our way of delivering the message is quite different from Dr. All. He reminds me of a college professor that I had, Dr. Brown, one of Auburn University's favorite professors, and how animated he is. I took two courses from Dr. Brown, and it was in the second course that I realized why he was acting that way, why he was so animated. And frankly, it was because he was able to keep people's attention by doing so. Um, and I believe that's one of the best things about Dr. All's delivery is that he will keep your attention and so I can appreciate that now over here on our channel like I said we are a little bit different I guess we can get a little boring at times because I don't add so much animation to my videos but hopefully we can keep it exciting by way of the content that we are presenting and today this is a, an exciting topic it is the third temple you know we are awaiting the opening of the third temple but there are some questions related to the third temple what it is where it is who it is blah 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 and we've done several classes on this this is one of our favorite topics over here at Hermes Academy is the third temple so you can check our channel for this I think we even created a playlist around uh, our classes that we've done on the third temple so you can check that out in this one we're gonna do it a little bit differently we're going to like I said we're gonna jump over here and we're going to look at this website on the third temple this is coming from openbible.info on the topic third temple now before I get into this class I do want to mention some a huge misunderstanding that's in the church and that's related to the word rapture um, there's a lot of people who are awaiting the rapture there's a lot of people who's getting excited about the rapture and I can appreciate that I do know that that day is coming I don't claim to know exactly when it's going to get here, but I do know for sure that it is going to get here. But one of the misunderstandings that I want to bring up about the rapture, and I did ask the Father if I should mention this at all, and that's how we are using the word rapture a little broadly. 
In other words, we are considering a lot of different events to be the rapture. For instance, the removal of the Gentile church before or during the tribulation. The opening or the creation of the third temple, there's a lot of people who call that the rapture. There's a lot of people who call the first harvest mentioned in Revelations as well as the second harvest mentioned in Revelations, they call that the rapture. There's a lot of people who refer to the great awakening as the rapture. There's a lot of people that refer to the laws being written on our heart as the rapture. The earthquake is considered to be the rapture by many. Uh, the calling away of the bride into the wilderness is a form of the word rapture. And all of these in a way is kind of correct. But when you start to dig down as to the particular parts of these individual events, you'll start to understand that a lot of these events happen on different days they all just don't happen on the same day and so to call all of them the rapture kind of adds a little bit of confusion to the issue you know and that's that's why you get a lot of argument from people who say stuff like well all of this is supposed to happen before the rapture and that's supposed to happen before the rapture or they'll say stuff like uh, nobody knows the day or the hour or the rapture or you know Diff just different arguments and that's because what one person is calling the rapture is different from what another person is calling the rapture and I don't really get into that too heavily on my channel because nobody really knows when exactly these events are going to take place and what they will involve when they actually take place in the first place we don't know exactly what's going to happen so the way I feel about it there's no real reason to try to argue or to try to nitpick you know as as far as what and as far as what the rapture exactly is and anyway anyway I'm gonna go on the reason why I mention that is because the building of the third temple like I said that event there's a lot of people who call that the rapture the building of the third temple is one of those events that would be uh, considered to be the uh, the rapture all right so but in this one we're gonna focus Primarily on the third temple and like we said, we're going to go down through some of these verses I don't know if we're gonna cover all of them. I haven't read all of them um, I only read like the first three or four when I decided to you know go ahead and do it this way I don't know what's going to come later on, but we're going to go down through here and we're going to try to answer um, The question of what the third temple is and then we're going to try to refer back to a lot of the questions That we have been getting by way of comments on our channel here recently all right, so let's just jump right into it. The first one is coming out of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Mm, yeah, let me go ahead and read it. It says, And he shall make a strong covenant, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination that shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. What? Okay. ESV, English Standard Version? Okay. If you say so. You know, we, we usually stick primarily to the King James Version, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to work with this one over here. Work with what we got. English Standard Version. Okay, let's see what it says. It's talking about how he, in verse 27, is talking about how he will make a strong covenant with many for one week. Now, this reminds me of a recent comment I got on my channel as an individual was trying to remind me of the common doctrine of the church and how it is that there is an Antichrist who will make a covenant with Israel for one week before the abomination of desolation. Like I said, that is the common understanding of Daniel chapter 9. But as I mentioned in my last class, we really have to reject, we really have to erase the board on all of the doctrine that we have gotten from our past religious leaders because quite frankly, they got a lot of it wrong. You know, I don't, I don't mean to sound arrogant or whatever, but it is my humble opinion, my humble observation that they got most of everything wrong, guys. 
when we actually put aside what we have heard from the church and heard from all of these religious ministers, you know, that repeat the same story. If it's something that somebody has been repeating over and over and over and over again, just stop for a minute and go in and find the scriptures where they're getting that information from and do your own research. Just forget about the fact that, you know, that, that, you know, this information has been passed down for hundreds of years and go in and actually look at what the, what the verses come from. Ask them where are they getting this information from? Where do you get these verses from that you're talking about? And then go over there and look for yourself, pray about it, may meditate on it and actually look at it for yourself. And what I have found when I've done so is that those guys actually got a lot of stuff wrong. They, I mean, they really did. I mean, I think we just need to erase the board and start over. Like we said in that other class, um, why would they have needed that information in the first place? If they, they, you know, came up with this stuff sometimes 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they came up with this. The whole rapture scenario was created by, I think, Darby in the 1800s or whatever. He's been gone long time since then. And you have to wonder, could is it possible that he got everything right back then? Um, remember that Daniel says that, you know, in the end times, knowledge will increase. So that means that it's increasing now, which means that we have the ability to understand more than they did back then. And so, so with all, all of that to say that, yeah, some of the common stuff that we're taught is, is an error. And let's look at what the error is in this verse here. Now, now, when we're talking about Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, and it says, He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Let's jump over here and look at Daniel right quick. And I don't plan on spending nearly as much time on, this, on these verses as I'm spending on this one. But let's look down here where it's talking about making a covenant. It says, And he shall make a covenant with many for one week. And so the common understanding that we've been passed down the common doctrine that's been passed down from the church is that this is the antichrist but now look here at verse 26 verse 26 is talking about the messiah verse 26 says after three score and two weeks shall messiah be cut off this is talking about yahushua hamashiach or jesus as many people call him but down here we've somehow changed over to the antichrist no guys this is not the antichrist and i believe the reason why is they, they see this part where it says and he shall make a covenant with many for one week and they said well if the messiah was crucified all of those many years ago how is he making a covenant for one week he was only here for three and a half years a week is seven years so how how was he able to do this see the answer is found up here in verse 25 which is also talking about the messiah it's saying how after 69 and a half weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. He's up there, it says in 24, it says 70 weeks are determined. But after 69 weeks, you're going to have this event here. Well, maybe this picture here by Clarence Larkin um, will help clear some of this up. Now, Clarence Larkin, before I get it, show you his diagram, he is one of the guys who is mostly responsible for the understandings that we have here in the church. He did a book called Dispensational Truth where he did a lot of diagrams on the uh, scripture. He broke down a lot of scripture the way he understood it, um, laying everything out in a way that we can understand in a way that we can understand. He was an engineer and he wrote and he wrote everything out like an engineer would, a bunch of diagrams and charts and stuff. But notice this. This was over a hundred years ago that he came up with this information. 1914. That's over a hundred years ago. Now, have we not learned anything since 1914? But I digress. Well, well, I'm going to show you over here is in his chart how he describes the 490 years. See how it started over here in 396. According to, Cla according to Clarence Larkin, it started over here in 396 B.C., I would say give or take 20 years, but then somehow this 490 years lasts all the way up to the second coming of Christ, which of course we know is almost 2,500 years later. You say, well, how is 
he fitting Daniel, see right there where it says Daniel 9, 24 through 27. You say, well, how is he fitting these 490 years into 2,500 years? And the reason why is because of the seventh week, Daniel's seventh week. Now, we did a class on that here recently. It's more about the tribulation. and But you see Daniel's seventh week. Now, you see this right here? I remind you again, this chart was created in 1914, but you see he was already teaching people about the Antichrist. This information that people try to tell us about, this is not new stuff, guys. This has been passed down for hundreds of years because Clarence Larkin, he was just an engineer. He wasn't a Bible expert. He just drew charts. So he even got his information from somebody else. It was passed down to him. But we're talking about the Messiah here and how the Messiah came at 483 years, about 483 years. You have to take into account the second temple being destroyed and all of that. And but if you but if you really work and try to understand these this 490th week, you'll find that it came very precise, very accurate down to the year, even down to the month. Maybe even the week is very, very accurate, but I'm not going to go into that in this video because it's a little bit detailed. But you'll see at 483 years, the Messiah came. You only had you, you had seven years left. 490 minus 483 is seven years left. But the Messiah was here for only three and a half years. Well, it was during that three and a half years that he was making a covenant with the disciples. Now, let that sink in for a minute. That is what he was actually doing with his disciples was he was teaching them how to live within the law. He was the word made flesh. He was the law made flesh. And whereas the Pharisees and the Sadducees had gotten off track by then because of their vanity and because of their immodesty and all of that, they have gotten way off track. They had even went as far as to turn the temple into a marketplace or whatever. So they wasn't really, you know, where they should be as far as the priests of the most high. And so the Messiah came in and chose the humble from among them and walk with them at 12 at one point 72 at another point where he taught them how to live within the law he spent er almost every day with these individuals teaching them about uh, the commandments the statutes the ordinances the precepts the judgments all of that stuff that we learned from Moses was the Messiah teaching his disciples for that three and a half years but then what does Daniel say that he was cut off meaning that they crucified him at three and a half years but what does Daniel say again but what does Daniel say he made a covenant for one week now See right here where it says, in the midst of that week shall the sacrifice and the oblation cease. That's in the middle of the three and a half weeks did the sacrifice cease. In other words, the Messiah stopped the sacrifices in the middle of it when he was crucified. When he was crucified, stopped the sacrifices there. That's what it means by in the midst of the week. But you see right here and it says, and he shall make a covenant with many for one week. You say, if he was only here for three and a half years... And he was supposed to make a covenant for seven years. But he was cut off for three and a half years. Where's the other three and a half years? It's over here at the end of the church age. Do we start to see the three and a half years? The other half of the three and a half years. Now, this three and a half year period, either it has already started and has just come to an end, like when like within the last four years or so, or it is ongoing right now. Or it is about to start. Either way, the three and a half years, the other half of the covenant building period is a end times event where the father is once again with his disciples teaching them to live within the covenant. Let me say that again. With his disciples teaching his disciples to live within the covenant. Now, there's a lot of people will understand that this is to be the 144,000. Those individuals that are the forerunners that are supposed to teach the rest of us how to live within the covenant. 
But my point is, is that it's not the Antichrist who is making this covenant. It is the Messiah who's making this covenant. And this is what Daniel is telling us over here. And he shall current and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And this is why they think it's the Antichrist because they're like, he stopped it. No, the Messiah stopped the sacrifice and the oblation. Now, if you read in the scripture, you'll find out that it is supposed to start again after the tribulation is over and humanity goes forward. We're going to have sacrifices and oblations. They may be different from what Moses taught us in the physical, but they will still have the sacred spiritual meanings as what Moses taught us, even if they do look different. But the thing is, they aren't ongoing now. They aren't going on right now. Now, I can go on into this verse if you want me to and explain. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make desolate. Let's jump back over here and look at uh, this ESV version and see what it says. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, even unto the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So you see right here is it's talking about somebody different. It's talking about one individual is up here that's going to make a covenant. And then down here is talking about another individual shall come. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. It's not the same person. You say, well, how does this verse have anything to do with the third temple? It is commonly understood that the sacrifices and the offerings ought to be made in the temple. However, when you read the scripture, it never tells you that they were required to take place in the temple. If you remember Passover, when it was instituted by Moses way back there in Exodus chapter 13, I believe, they didn't even have a temple or a tabernacle, yet they were commanded to keep Passover. And never does it tell you to limit those activities to a temple. You got to remember, it was kind of like David and Solomon's idea to even build a temple. All right, let's go on to the next one. This apparently got some kind of vote here. I don't know what that's all about. This is my first time being on this website. Let's see what it says. This is coming out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. Now, we can add this to the list of what people call the rapture. Like we said, there's a lot of events that people call the rapture. And the second coming of the Messiah is one of those events lumped into that word. It says, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord shall come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. OK, let me slow down here. Um, it's talking about up there let no man shake you in your belief in the rapture and that ain't my intention you know I do want to clarify that we are using that word a little bit broadly but like I said at the beginning of this video using it broad or not it's gonna happen it's coming it's coming soon too um, then he goes on to say uh, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and this is talking about the uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus. It will be followed by the rebellion come first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exhausts himself against the so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So here, so here people use this argument for to say that there will actually be a physical brick and mortar temple. They say, well, how can this lawlessness, this man of lawlessness sit in a spiritual building? It must be a brick and mortar temple. Now, I have no doubts that there's going to be a brick and mortar temple. I do understand that the third temple, the capital T, capital T, capital T, the third temple, will be built on the hearts of humanity but that's not to say that they're not going to build a real 
that's not to say that they're not going to build a brick and mortar temple over there on the holy site in Jerusalem. The only problem with that is that there's a whole other building sitting there now, but they have plans to remove that building. Like it or not, they got plans to getting rid of it. It's just a matter of time when they're actually going to start the deconstruction of the Dome of the Rock so they can start to build this third temple over there. Now, is this where this man of lawlessness is going to stand in that brick and mortar temple? Well, I have a hard time understanding how he's going to be sitting in that spiritual temple. So that can very well be the case. But let me jump back up to this part right here where he says, unless the rebellion come first. Now, I know I'm not going to get through all of these because I'm moving too slow. But look over here in 2 Thessalonians, according to the King James Version. And it says, except the fallen away comes first. The fallen away. Now, this is what we have to expect here, is the great falling away to come first. And what I understand this to be is the result of all of these misunderstandings. That are, there's a lot of people whose faith is built around these misunderstandings. Like we said, we have been receiving this information for hundreds of years. Our grandmother teaches us this stuff. Great granddaddy can tell us the scenarios that are supposed to take place in the end times and we are still repeating those even until today. So what happens when it don't go down just the way we thought it was going to go down? For instance, what happens if there's not an antichrist that makes a covenant with Israel for seven years? Well, I'm going to tell you what happens. People are going to start losing faith. People have been expecting it to go down a certain way all of this time. And when it goes down differently than the way they were taught and the way they have believed. It's going to shake their faith. It's going to make them question whether everything they've heard is a lie or not. And so what you're going to have is a great falling away. People are going to want to reject everything. It's like they're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's like, you know, they've lied about this. They've lied about that. They must have lied about everything. And there's going to be a huge falling away. Now, the reason why I bring this up is to prevent you guys from doing that. You know, when you start to see some of the material manifestations of this stuff start to occur meaning when you actually start to see it play out in real time and it looks differently than what you have been taught understand where the error is is not in the word it's not in the scripture is don't blame it on the bible you can't even really necessarily blame it on the preachers and the teachers because they are just repeating what they've heard you have to blame it on these people way back long time ago that made up these stories. And I don't necessarily say we should blame them, but we have to blame it on the fact that we have been using ancient understandings of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Imagine if there were imagine if we did this in the medical industry. Imagine if the people in the medical industry were completely committed to using only medical teachings and medical understandings from from doctors that had come before them hundreds of years ago. In other words, they would not separate themselves from the knowledge that was passed down from ancient doctors. They would be doing stuff like bloodletting. They would still be allowing people to drink mercury. They will be cutting they will be cutting holes in people's heads to get rid of migraines. You know, stuff that they did hundreds of years ago, the doctors have found out that a lot of that stuff was in error and they have rejected it and will not do it, will not practice that stuff today. If they did some of that stuff back then that those ancient doctors taught and wrote down in medical books, if they use that in their practice today, most of them would lose their doctor's licenses. Most of them would lose the ability to be doctors in the first place, and so they had to reject that ancient knowledge. Well, we have to do so in our ministries as well. We have to remember that, you know, those guys, they, that was a long, long time ago that, you know, they came up with this stuff. You see here how Cl Clarence Larkin is going into the 1,260 days? 
that's not new information there's not there's not 1260 days in three and a half years the holy calendar has a 364 day calendar it's not 360 days it's 364 days but I say all of that to say this is information has been passed down at least since 1914 but again this was just a retired engineer who did this and he got his information from people that was even further back in history than that how can we assume that these guys were correct 